The last time we talked about the augmented Lagrangian method, ALM. The idea is to, so first of all, we are considering this uh, constraint uh, minimization problem. So we minimize F1 plus F2, but this X and Z, they are coupled via this uh, linear equation. So um, so what we did last time is to formulate the dual problem, the dual problem of this uh, yeah. associated with this primal problem. So, yeah. And uh, um, so this is the, the dual problem. So essentially, we are minimizing uh, the lambda that uh, minimizing lambda over this uh, objective function. Okay. This objective function involves the conjugate uh, of F1 and F2. And then the augmented Laplangian method is basically applying proximal point method for solving the, this problem. Okay. The form of the three algorithm is as follows. So in the first step, we are solving this uh, augmented uh, problem, which is the objective function regularized by this uh, extra quadratic term. This quadratic term basically measures the the error associated with the, the violation of the linear constraint plus the Lagrangian multiplier lambda t. So this is the primal uh, step. And the dual step is dual update is basically updating the Lagrangian multiplier lambda. Okay. So it's a two-step process. But we mentioned last time that this algorithm is very hard to implement in practice because uh, solving the first problem is very hard. Okay, this problem in general is very hard to solve for X and Z. And then we consider this uh, or this idea of alternating updates, okay, which leads to the ADMM method, alternating direction method of multipliers. The idea is that for the ALM method, for the first update, we further decompose it into two updates by alternatively updating uh, between X and Z. Okay. So for the, for the X update, uh, we will fix Z. So Z will be the ZT that we obtained from the previous iteration. So we fix Z and lambda, we only update X. Okay. And for the Z, we will fix X and lambda, only update Z. And then lastly, we will update lambda by fixing X and by using the updated X and Z. So basically, we can we can just see from this. Uh, it's basically uh, further decomposing this the first step in the ALM method into two steps. Okay. We fix z and lambda only update x. Okay. In 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 that case, this part can be ignored because it is a constant. And then we fix x and lambda and update z. So the first loss function can be removed because it's a constant. So it's an alternating update followed by a dual update. Okay. So this is the uh, ADMM method. And this, this update rule uh, is, is very it's much simpler because in every step, for example, for the first step we are fixing z and lambda only updating x now if you look at this problem we are minimizing f1x 
plus a term that uh, involves quadratic term on X. Okay. Uh, if A is a very simple matrix, then this is basically a proximal operator and we have an analytical solution. Otherwise, we can just use gradient methods to optimize this, uh, proximal gradient methods to, to optimize that, to solve this problem. And for the second step, it's the same idea. So it's much simpler. And let's look at the, some applications of this uh, ADMM method. So the first example is the robust PCA problem, uh, which is uh, related to the homework eight that we are going to discuss later. So this problem is given as follows. <clears throat> we observe a matrix M, which is a superposition of a low rank matrix and uh, some sparse noise. Okay, basically, we have this observation, M equals to L plus S. Well, L is a very, very nice low rank matrix. You can see this matrix is low rank because uh, it's, it is actually rank two. Because all these columns, they are they are exactly the same, right? So they are they are linearly dependent, and the second for the second block, all these columns they are they are same. They are also the same. So this matrix is of rank two, so we call it the low rank matrix. In many data, for many data sets, we can observe these uh, low rank low rank structures. And then another matrix is a noise. It's kind of like a, you can say it could be a Gaussian noise, it could be a, uh, it's actually a sparse noise. Sparse means that most of the entries in this matrix are zero and only few of them takes non-zero values. Okay? And in general, it looks like a noise, sparse noise matrix. matrix. So our observation is a low rank it's a superposition of these two. So adding these two together, we only observe this matrix. So this is, so the left-hand side is what we are given. We are, we are only given this uh, noisy matrix M. And the goal is to decompose this matrix M into a low rank plus a sparse part to success you can say, you can call it denoising to successfully denoise or remove this noise from these low rank structures. And this is related to the uh, video surveillance application. Because as we discussed before, uh, for videos, uh, videos are 3D frames. For example, this is a short video. Well, these uh, small objects is moving from left to right. Okay, so it's a video. Now, how do we formulate this? Uh, and, and and the goal, the goal is to uh, extract, find, de develop an algorithm to detect these moving objects, and maybe so you want to decompose this video into two parts a static background and a moving object. Right, so that's the very, uh, very interesting application. And uh, so maybe in this case, the static background it looks like it's basically uh, the same background frame that uh, repeated three times, right? That's the background, static background. And moving object is uh, basically this uh,
right? That's the moving object. And if we stack every uh, if we stack every uh, every frame into one column vector, so every frame is a two dimensional matrix, for example, with an image. We make it a uh, two dimension. If we stack it, you can stack it column wise or row wise. For example, if you stack all the columns of this image, and make it a long vector, right? Then every frame becomes a single vector, right? And then you stack all these frames together. This will be this will give us a matrix. And you can see this static background matrix is uh, low rack because uh, all the frames, all these static backgrounds, they are exactly the same. So in intuitively, all these columns, they will be the same with, with each other. And a matrix with all the columns, a matrix having all the columns exactly the same is a rank one matrix. Right, so so these static backgrounds are low rank matrix. Well, for the moving object part, again, you can convert every uh, such image into a column vector. Okay? And maybe this moving object is somewhere, for example, it could be here. It's a small moving object. And the thing is that for this uh, for this particular image, the background is zero, okay? Because because all all the most of the background are static, and they they will be, so most of background are static. They will they will be in this uh, static back background part, right? So for the moving object part, every everything else is zero except for this moving object. So when you convert it into a column vector, it's just a sparse vector with a few entries, with a few non-zero entries that describes the location of the moving object. Okay. And then for the second second frame, maybe the object well changes its location, like something like that. And the... And only these entries are non-zero. All the other entries are zero because, right, because most parts, they are static backgrounds. Therefore, this is a low rank. The, the static background forms a low rank structure. But the moving and the moving object, it has a sparse structure. Right, so so we are looking at the superposition of uh, low rank and the sparse sparse matrices. <clears throat> That's why um, this problem is very popular. Okay? It's not just in the video surveillance, but in many other data data set, industrial data, you can always find such a. A low rank and sparse <coughs> structures in the data. But now let's let's imagine this is a video with a moving objects. Right? Every column is a frame. Moving objects is there's so many moving objects here. And then this video has a underlying static background. And then the rest part is the moving objects, the pixels of those moving objects. The problem is that given uh, given this video, can we extract the static background and also figure out the moving objects? <clears throat> right. So this is a mathematical uh, optimization problem. So we will solve this problem by the following convex uh, convex pro by solving the following convex optimization problem. Okay. First, we have this constraint. 
this constraint to, is to say that our given beta m, right, m is this uh, given video Our data, uh, or you can say our video is a superposition of two, two types of data, L plus S. Okay, they have the same dimension, dimensionality. Now, for L, we want it to have low rank. For S, we want to we want it to to be sparse. Right? So, therefore, this motivates us to build up this loss function. We want to minimize the nuclear norm of this L and the L1 norm of S, right? Because in the previous lectures, we have mentioned that L1 norm is used to uh, model the sparsity level of the, of the data. Okay? So it's L1 norm is the summation of all the absolute values of all the entries in S. So we want to minimize this L1 norm of S so that basically uh, we are looking for a sparse solution S. And we also want to minimize the nuclear norm of L. And previously we have also discussed this nuclear norm is uh, approximately the rank of this matrix L. So minim by minimizing the nuclear norm of L, we are promoting a uh, low rank structure on this solution L. So we put these two terms together and give it a weight, lambda. Lambda is a tuning parameter. Okay. So the entire objective function is to minimize, minimize uh, Ls such that the nuclear norm of L plus the L1 norm of S is minimized. <clears throat> and this is this is a convex problem because both of these both of these two functions, nuclear norm, L1 norm, they are convex functions. Uh, but they are not differentiable. They are not differentiable. Okay. So putting things together We want to, so for this problem, what is the input? The input is the matrix M, okay? You need to give me a video first, okay? So you give me a video M, and I want to decompose it into two parts, L plus S, so that the nuclear norm of L is minimized, and also the L1 norm of S is minimized. So essentially, I'm looking for a decomposition that has a low rank and a sparse, sparse structure. And this problem is not uh, it's not that easy because uh, these two structures are very uh, highly non-smooth. L1 is non-differentiable, nuclear norm is non-differentiable. And uh, these two functions are just complicated. So the L1 norm, recall the L1 norm is the summation of all the absolute entries. Right? And what is the nuclear norm? Nuclear norm is the summation of all the singular values of the matrix L. Okay? So for any matrix, you can have a unique singular value decomposition. Once you you can do it with MATLAB or Python, and then summing up all the singular values, give you the nuclear okay. However, this problem exactly falls into the LADMM framework. I recall that in the ADMM we are looking at this uh, this optimization problem. Right. So if you compare these two, basically F one 
So X would be that L and Z would be that S. And they are, of course, here they are the L and S are matrix. But there's no difference. So F1 is basically the nuclear norm function. F2 is the lambda times the L1 norm function. And we have this linear constraint. Now this may this matrix A and B, they are, in this case, they are identity. They are just identity matrix. So it's just X plus Z equals to B. Here it's just L plus S equals to M. All right, so this exactly falls into the ADMM framework. So we can apply by specifying these uh, functions and constraints, we can apply the ADMM algorithm to solve this problem. And this is the ADMM algorithm, uh, spe specific update rules of the ADMM algorithm. Um, right, so this is F1. This is F1 plus this uh, periodic term. So in the first step, we update L. We update L by solving this uh, Sub problem. The sub problem is to minimize L. Well, the loss function is what? It's the nuclear norm plus a quadratic term. And this is exactly the definition of proximal method, right? It's a function plus a quadratic term. L minus the rest of the parts. So the first, the first. Uh, Optimization problem is exactly the definition of the proximal operator. Um, in fact, yeah, we can just write it <clears throat> more explicitly. So L T T plus one is out mean L. So I'm going to divide everything by rho, right? That doesn't uh, affect the optimization problem. So okay, so so then we have this uh quadratic term is L subtracts S T. Oh actually subtracts negative S T <coughs> plus M right minus one over rho lambda t. Right, <clears throat> just rewriting the, the first step by dividing m by rho. Right? And by definition, this is the proximal method. So <laughs> something function plus one over two L minus some constant vector to the power of t. Right, it's just a definition of proximal mapping. So this is a proximal mapping associated with one over rho nuclear norm, right? Now evaluated at this point. Okay. So if we can find out the an analytical expression for this proximal mapping, then we have we can implement the first step. So in that case, it would be very simple. First, we calculate this uh, matrix. Uh, ST is given by the previous equation. M is our input data. Lambda T is also given by the previous equation. Okay. We have that. We can we can compute this and then do a proximal mapping on top of that. Right. And we will see how to do this proximal mapping later. And similarly for the second step, <coughs> for the second step, it's the same thing, right? You just uh, you can again divide everything by row. So it will be an, uh, the proximal mapping associated with uh, this L1 norm. And uh, 
evaluated at so it's s minus the rest of the terms okay so evaluated at that point again you can you can express it uh, in terms of the proximal method of the L1 norm. And we know the proximal mapping of L1 norm is the soft stretch holding operator. Uh, so you can check the previous lectures. The last step is very simple step. Last update is very simple. So it looks like we can apply ADMM to solve this problem. And uh, the key operations is the first two, which are basically proximal mappings associated with the nuclear norm and L1 norm. So if we know how to do that, we can implement this algorithm. And here I should note that this, this, one, this F is the Frobenius norm of a matrix, which is basically, you know, you treat a matrix as a long vector, it's a big vector. And the Frobenius norm is just L2 norm of that vector. So basically, this is exactly the same as the definition of proximal method. <clears throat> so basically here, you treat this matrix as a vector. Okay, now the question is, how do we solve, how do we solve those two proximal mappings? Uh, it turns out that we have analytical expression for for these two operations. Okay. They can be done in an analytical way. And it's given by the following uh, analytical expression. So the first step, this is the analytical solution to the first step. Okay, so let's go back to the, this is the first step. And we, which corresponds to this uh, proximal mapping. And this proximal mapping has a, an, an analytical expression given, given as follows. And this part is called the singular value stretch holding operation. Okay, so what happens is that First, we compute this uh, matrix, right? M minus ST minus this lambda T. This is exactly what we have here, right? M minus ST minus one over rho lambda T. Okay. And then the, 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 the answer is that this proximal mapping turns out to be the soft, the singular value stretch coding operation. Now, what, what does this operation do? First, you compute this matrix. Okay, you can do that in your code. Okay, once you have that matrix, you, you will put it into this SVT operator. You put it into this SVT operator uh, with a parameter rho, uh, one over rho. This SVT operator is defined as follows. Okay. SVT operator applied to a matrix X with parameter tau. So basically there are two two things. One is the input matrix X, but in this case, it, it is this matrix. So one is the input matrix X, one is the parameter tau. Now in this case, the tau is basically one over rho, right? But this is a general form. <coughs> now given the matrix X, given the tau, this SVT operator does the following things. First, you can do a singular value decomposition and make this, uh, you can decompose X into uh, U sigma times V transpose. Right? This is a standard decomposition that you can perform in, in the match level of Python. It's just called the SVD function. Now, this decomposition will decompose the matrix into uh, U and V, they are both orthogonal matrix. Sigma is a diagonal matrix, okay. diagonal matrix. Well, the di diagonal elements are the corresponding singular values. Okay. It's very similar to an eigen eigenvalue decomposition. Okay. First, you do this SVD. You can call any package <coughs> to do it. And then what you do is that 
you do a, a thresholding on the singular values. Okay. So for the for this diagonal matrix sigma, for those singular values, you you will subtract them by tau. Tau is this prime group. Subtract all the singular values by tau, and then only keep those who are positive. Okay. Basically, if sigma minus tau is bigger than zero, then you keep it. Okay. This parenthesis plus means that we only keep those positive results. Okay. So you first subtract all the singular values by tau. It may happen that some of them may be bigger than tau, some of them may be smaller than tau. Okay. So if they are if this if the singular values are bigger than tau, you just keep it. Okay, this 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 does not. It's basically x positive is uh, max between x and the zero. Okay. If this result is positive, you keep it. Otherwise, if, if, if it is smaller than zero, then you set it to be zero. Okay, so it's called a thresholding operator. Basically, you are removing all those singular values that are smaller than tau in some sense. Okay. So this, this, this part is called singular value, singular value threshold. We modify the spectrum of this matrix. After that, you will multiply by U and V transpose. Okay. You will reassemble this, uh, these matrices together and uh, try to reconstruct the matrix X. Okay. Now intuitively, this is, we, we do this because uh, this operation will make the matrix low rank. Because we, you are removing some of the singular values that have small magnitudes. Those are kind of noisy structures in the matrix. So we are only keep keep those singular values that has a high magnitude. So that will make this matrix L low rank. That is what we want in the final result. Right. So so basically you will implement the first first line following this uh, following this one do a singular value decomposition, and then for the singular values, you do a thresholding, and then reassemble all the paths. Okay, this is the first step. The second step is a soft thresholding operator applied to these, these matrix. Again, once you have the LT plus one from the first step, you can get this result, you can get this matrix. And then you are going to apply this uh, ST, soft thresholding ST operator with this parameter to this matrix. Now this ST operator is defined as, as follows. It's ST tau, tau is the parameter. How is this lambda times one over rho? X is the, the input, the, the entire input matrix. This is the standard soft thresholding operator that we discussed before. Uh, basically, for the for it, it applies to the matrix element-wise. Okay. So for the IJ's entry, you do the following. Basically, if that entry has a magnitude smaller than tau, you remove it. Otherwise, you subtract by tau or plus by tau, depend, depending on the sign. Okay, so this is a soft threshold. <coughs> now, intuitively, this operation will make the matrix sparse because of this thresholding uh, operation. And this is what we want in the final result. We want S to be a sparse matrix. Right. So L is a singular value threshold to make it low rank. S is soft threshold in making, making sparse. And finally, the ADMM will up, update this uh, 
the, this lambda, the Laplacian multiplier lambda. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the ADMML we apply to the robust PCA problem. Okay, and in the once we know all these details, we can just uh, we can just to solve this problem. So okay, I give you, I give you a video. You can use this algorithm to decompose it into a low rank plus sparse part. Okay. So this is homework eight, and then you can tune this lambda a little bit to make it uh, to make the results looks better. So this is a robust PCA. Uh, the other problem is a graphical uh, lasso. It also arises in the, some machine learning or statistic, statistics applications. So the objective function is that, uh, so here we are trying to learn a sparse Gaussian graphic model. Okay? Uh, but the problem looks like this. We are minimizing a matrix theta so that <clears throat> so the loss function is, is the negative log determinant of theta plus a linear term plus an L1 term. This the first two parts corresponds to the negative log likelihood of a Gaussian graph model. So we can uh, we don't have time to go into this part, but uh, so this part is associated with a graphical model. And then we are looking for a theta that is sparse. And also we have a constraint that theta must be positive semi-definite. So we want to solve this problem while theta is positive semi-definite. So what we can do is to put this constraint as an indicator function. In indicator of a positive semi-definite uh, the set of positive semi-definite matrices. And then we put this phi, we introduce a select variable phi, auxiliary variable phi, and then we make theta equals to phi. Okay, so essentially this is just a rewrite of this problem. And then this equation falls into the falls into this form. We have a linear constraint. In this case, a very simple theta equals to five. And then we have loss function. We can divide this big loss function into two parts. The L1 norm is one part. The first three terms is another part. Okay. And then we can just apply ADMM to solve it. Okay. The first step, we're looking for this uh, solving this optimization problem over theta. Well, theta must be positive semi -definite. Second step for, for this phi, we are optimizing the L1 norm. And lastly, we update the, the dual, the Laplangian multiplier. And turns out that not it's clear that the second one is a soft soft thresholding operator. We just talked about the first one is uh, turns out that it also has a analytical uh, solution. So this is the solution for the first sub problem. F rho is defined as follows. Again, this uh this is a uh, F rho applied to at matrix X is basically uh first we do a eigenvalue decomposition. Okay, because X is symmetric in this case, and then uh, we will modify the this 
eigenvalues in this way. Okay. So again, it's very similar to the singular values thresholding, but in this case, we're working on eigenvalues instead of singular values. But you can just follow these uh, three steps to implement this algorithm. Okay, so these two problems, robust PCA graphical lines, so they are just uh, small scale problems. Usually, um, we are just working on on one computer, and ADMM is also famous for a uh, distributed, um, distributed learning or distributed optimization. Well, you are working with a network of uh, sensors, or uh, some other data data agents. Okay. So, so if you do networking, you will see uh, this kind of problems uh, quite often. But we want to minimize x over this loss function. The loss function is sum of f i x, where i is from one to n. Yeah. <coughs> So we want to minimize, it's basically f1x plus f2x. So previously we only see two or three of these loss functions, right? Robust PCA, we have two graphical loss, so we have three to four. But here we are looking at a more general setting. Okay, we, we want to minimize some of Bunch of loss functions. And the, the underlying setting is that uh, there's an underlying network. There's an underlying network. It could be like that. Right? Every node is a sensor or data center or any abstract node. And every node will collect some data and uh, you want to do some learning or optimization task on over this network. So the, the, the overall goal is to, uh, oh, my bad, I have another people. So, the goal is to uh, minimize the total loss over the network. For example, F1 is the loss function of node one. F2 is the loss function of node two. You want to work out a variable X that minimize the total loss over the entire network. Right? This X may correspond to some control variables. Uh, so that you want to control the entire network to meet some criteria. And those criteria will uh, be described by these loss functions. So here we are looking at this, uh, <coughs> this problem. And the challenge of this problem is that, um, first of all, this N could be huge, right? This N corresponds to the for example, the number of agents in that you can look at the thousands of nodes or even tens of thousands of nodes. So it's really large scale. The other thing is that we want to develop an algorithm that is uh, decentralized. Because in practice, every node will only have access to its own function. For example, node one may only have access to F1. No two only have access to F2. So you want to you want the algorithm to be decentralized so that every node only needs to compute something related to the local data, to the to the local function. Otherwise, if you want to do a centralized uh, learning, you have to first <coughs> collect all the data, all the information over this network. That can be a very challenging uh, task. 
And ADMM provides an excellent solution for this uh, for the network setting. So we will first reformulate the problem by introducing uh, multiple auxiliary variables. So instead of putting a common X here, we first assign every Fi a, a corresponding Xi. And then we, we want to make sure that all the Xi's, they are equal. So they reach a consensus. But basically, this, these two problems are exactly the same because uh, here the, the constraint makes sure that all the exercises are, are equal. Okay. <clears throat> and then for this constraint, we rewrite it into a matrix form. <laughs> First, we, so this constraint, because we have n constraints here, right? Every xi equals to z. In total, we have n equalities, equality constraint here. We put, we stack them together and formulate this uh, matrix, uh, matrix constraint. So if we first we stack all the xi's together into a column into a column, and then it's basically saying that x equals to identity times z. Okay, and you can check that by matrix multiplication rule. This this matrix equation is to say that x one equals to i times z, x n equals to i times z. So it's essentially x i equals to z. So we are just rewriting this uh, multiple constraints into a big matrix, into a big constraint using matrix vector notations. So here, every every this every of these x, i, and z, they are column vectors by default. Right. So this is a stack of all the column vectors. And this each i is a identity matrix associated with this, this uh, vector. And we call this we call this x1 to the concatenation of x1 to xn, we call it u. Okay, we, we give it a separate notation here. Okay, therefore, therefore, this optimization problem okay, is again forced into the <coughs> ADMM framework because uh, if you look at the constraint, it's just it, it is just u equals to identity. Okay, looking at the this. Looking at this constraint, it's just the u equals to uh, this blockwise identity matrix multiplied by z. Okay, so it's a linear constraint. U equals to some matrix times z. Okay. U and z are the uh, variables of this problem. And then looking at the loss function, it only involves like like this entire summation of this loss. This entire summation only involves the parameter u, because u contains all these xi's. So the loss function is only about u. Okay. So we are looking at some some problem like. Okay. Like this. We're looking at minimize FU subject to this constraint. 
Well, this fu is given by this uh given in this form. And this is our fu. <clears throat> so it's even simpler than uh the more the, the general form that we considered. So in the general form we have two functions, we have a more complicated uh, linear constraint. But this means that we can still apply ADMF to solve this problem. Okay, so we apply that and uh, we will end up with these several steps. Okay, <coughs> the, the first step is to update this U. And the first step is to update this U. The second step is to update this Z, okay? The last step is to update lambda. So, so they are pretty standard. But so let's look at what happened in each step. In the first step, updating the U. First, this is the FU, right? This is this FU. It's basically, basically the sum of all the laws. And uh, this is the quadratic term. That involves all the xi's and the zt lambda t's, <coughs> and the the in the first step we are minimizing over u. Basically, we are minimizing over all these uh, variables xi's. And the nice thing about the first term is that uh, it may look complicated because of because of this two summation. Summation meaning that it's a sum. Summation over all the nodes, but in this case they are decom they are separable Be because you see in the ice in every in every term of this summation we are only involving one variable x i. That means we can simply uh, solve this solve each optimization problem uh, separately. Right, so so they are they are fully separable. Every uh, every summit first of all you can pull out this summation. So you so essentially you we are looking at sum of i f i x i plus uh this term. Right. So every term in the summation only involves xi. And we are minimizing over all different xi's. So the answer is that we can just uh, separately work out each of these. Uh, we can just uh, we can just uh, minimize each xi separately. And this can be done on each node by itself. Because the i's node, right, the i's node have access to fi, so it can solve this problem by itself. Right. So, so basically the first step can be implemented in a decentralized manner. Okay, just every node. If you have a million nodes, here this capital N could be one million. But due to this uh, fully separable structure, every node just need to solve its own problem. Okay, every node just need to solve its own problem. And this problem is, is essentially a proximal mapping, right? Because it's FIX plus a periodic term. So it's basically a proximal mapping associated with FI. So if FI are simple, you can compute that. All right. So the first so the first step is a decentralized optimization step. 
Now the second step is to update Z. By looking at the problem, we don't have a loss function in Z. We only have FU here. So the, so the Z part is zero. We don't have the loss function. So we only have, we only have this quadratic term. Right? We don't have this loss function. So now we only have this quadratic term. And the solution to this, to this problem, you can verify that is intuitively it's just the average of all the x i's. It's a it's a quadratic uh, problem, so you can just take derivative and set it to zero. You can solve for the optimal z, but in the end, it's something. It is a uh, related to the average value of all the xi's. So this is like a consensus step. Consensus step, why? Because in the first step, you you let every node work out this xi, okay, xi t plus one. So those solutions will be stored locally in, in each node, right? And then in the second step, z, you will pull out pull this information from all the nodes and uh, reach try to reach a consensus by performing a simple average. So this is what the second step does. But we collect information from all the nodes to a to an average to reach a consensus. And then in the last step, we will just update the background multipliers for every node corresponding. So the so the last step will be implemented on each node. <clears throat> right, so this is the a more detailed uh, illustration of the entire algorithm. The, again, the first step can be carried out in parallel on each node. Okay, so this, this one can be it's, it's super computation efficient efficient. If you have a million nodes, just do them in parallel. Second step is what we call the consensus step. You need to imagine there will be a central server. Uh, there's a central server connected to all the nodes. So what happens is that all the nodes will communicate communicate this information with the central server. Okay, this is generated by the node I. And then the central server will compute the average. So this is called a consensus step. Once we have this consensus, Z, ZT plus one, we will brought the central server will broadcast this ZT plus one to all the nodes. And finally, all the nodes will use this consensus to update the corresponding uh, Lagrangian multiplier lambda. Um, okay. So in the, in the final step, we need a broadcast. We need to broadcast the consensus to all the nodes again. Okay. So you see, this is a very, very interesting, a very smart design. Uh, so that the computation is, is done in parallel by all the nodes. And what, what this ADMM is trying to do is to you know, first distribute the computation to all the nodes. So you don't have computation bottleneck. And then uh, you constantly do consensus to exchange information, right? And then you broadcast, broadcast this consensus to all the nodes. To update the information, so 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 this algorithm is run is running like a uh, there's an uplink and downlink throughout this uh, this uh, learning process, okay. and most of the cloud computing algorithms are designed in a similar way. So this shows that ADMM is very well suited for distributed optimization. And if you look at the entire algorithm, every node just need to process 
its own information. And then we just gather all the all the updates from the nodes. And then once we reach a consensus, we just broadcast this consensus to all the nodes again. So I will leave the convergence analysis of ADM to the to the next lecture. So right after now we just we talk about the applications of ADM, but we have not shown its convergence. Okay. It is motivated by the A alternating augmented Lagrangian method, but without much justification. So this result will show that ADM can converge uh, for for convex problems. And uh, for the homework, you can start to work on homework eight. Well, is that, so we are, basically looking at this uh, robust PCA problem. So it's just uh, implementing the algorithm that we talk about in the in the class. But here, uh, so I will give you, I think you can you can download that from the canvas from the homework page. So this matrix M, what is this? <clears throat> so I give you a video The video has 3,055 frames, uh, if I remember correctly. Every frame is RGB, right? The, the color, it's RGB color for uh, image. And the, the pixel size is 160 by one, uh, 120. So the total pixels is about 19,000, but you have three channels. Okay. Um, so what we are what we will do we will just uh, extract the moving objects in the RGB channels separately and then assemble them into a RGB video output. So you just follow these instructions and try to uh, process the data. Okay. Uh, basically, we will do to process this uh, data. We will just uh, We will divide M into three channels, RGB. For every channel, we will do this uh, separation algorithm. Right? And then finally, we put we will uh, put all these uh, outcomes together to generate an RGB as separated result. So you have an RGB background, you have RGB moving object. So the idea is that for every channel, you want to reshape it to a matrix of this dimension. Okay. Uh, this is the this 19,000, 19,200 is the lens. It's the number of pixels that we have for every uh, image. It's, it's just the, all the, you are stacking all the pixels in one frame into a column vector. Okay. And then we have 3,055 frames. So in total, it is becomes a, this big matrix. And then you want for such a matrix M, you want to decompose it into L and S. Okay. And the, Yeah, I think you can just follow this. Uh, it depends on how 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 strong you your computer is. So here I would suggest to 
uh, further cut this uh, matrix, big matrix, into five smaller blocks. And for each block, you run that algorithm to, to do a separation. Otherwise, uh, it may be computation intensive when you do the SVD, singular value decomposition for such a big matrix. But uh, yeah, you, so you can flexibly uh, choose these parameters by yourself, depending on the computation power you have. But the implementation of the ADM algorithm is exactly uh, described in the in this part. Uh, this is the ADM algorithm applied to to that problem. Um, right. So this pro for this problem, you have two. You have an input matrix M, you have a parameter lambda, right? Once you have this M, once you have this lambda, you can just run this algorithm. Uh, yeah, and this row, by the way, this row is the step size that you need to specify. Okay? So you can just try some, some values. So this, this row parameter is a step size parameter that you need to choose. So therefore, to implement this uh, <coughs> algorithm, you need first you need the input m is given by the data by the data set. The parameter lambda here, I have some, I have some recommendation lambda equals to one over square root of nineteen thousand two hundred, but you can just uh, tune it a little bit around this point. Like sometimes a smaller lambda will be better. Sometimes a bigger one will be better. For example, if you if you find that in your final result you see the low rank part has uh, some noise has some noise in it, you may want to enlarge this lambda so that you know you want to or well, actually you want to decrease the value of lambda so so that you put more emphasis on the low rank structures. Okay, so it's just a uh, uh, try and error thing. And then you choose a step size row. You choose a parameter row to that controls the convergence speed and the convergence quality of this algorithm. Okay. Again, this row shouldn't shouldn't be too big to avoid divergence, shouldn't be too small to avoid slow convergence. But what you can do is that you can monitor like for every 50 or 100 iterations, you can monitor this uh, loss function. You can monitor the loss function. So intuitively, you should see that the loss function is decreasing. Um, yeah, and then you can see how <coughs> you can you can visualize the convergence quality of your algorithm, and then maybe that will guide you to further fine tune the step size problem. So, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um. Yeah, next time I can, I probably can show you some of the 
results that are obtained by the students in the previous semester. Uh, some of the results are really amazing. Uh, so I don't have the videos right now, but I can download them from. The, I need to find out find find out them from the uh, previous courses. Yeah, but this this implementation will take some time. So, so I put it as a final project. Okay. So the the I will just watch your video outcome and. Uh, okay, so your output would be a video. Okay, you upload those videos online. So basically, the input is a video. And the output is a, a background, a RGB background with an RGB moving object. So maybe we can look at this. Uh, Yeah, is this file video surveillance? Let me download it. Okay, I guess it's too slow. It's 150 megabytes. Um, yeah, you download it, you need to unzip it. It has 3,000 uh, images. So I, I guess I will not do it here. Yeah, you can download it when you go back home and uh, try to read these uh, instructions. And uh, if you have any questions, confusions, just talk to me uh, because this will take like several weeks or even a month to complete. Okay, so. So the deadline for the homework eight is December one, okay. But make sure you work on it, uh, from starting from now on because it takes some time, and especially for the computation part, uh, this SVD may take a while depending on what kind of computer you are using. <clears throat> Okay, so we can uh, stop here. So talk to me if you have any questions about this homework eight, and we can go over the details uh, together. But the algorithm is essentially given here on the slide 17 of this lecture, where you can check this algorithm. Now, every operator are uh, explained in detail. All right, so then we'll stop here today and I uh, will talk to you next week. We'll go through the emergence analysis next Tuesday.